So this evening, I would like to welcome uh, Simon Carter. Thank you for coming, Simon. Simon is a painter inspired by his immediate landscape. And Simon is also a curator and co-founder of the artist-led group Contemporary British Painting, amongst many other things. And Simon has his work in collections in the UK and abroad as well. Um, Simon, thank you so much for coming this evening. I'd like uh, to start by asking Joe if you could share the first slide. And I'll start by asking you about uh, what informs your paintings and tell us about your long lasting relationship really with the landscape. Uh, yes, my paintings come out of a very um, limited rain, uh, landscape, which is within maybe three or four miles of my studio. It's on the sort of Essex coast, the North Essex coast near uh, Frinton, Walton, Clacton around there. And um, I suppose in a sense, it is a very limited landscape but because of that I know it very well and it becomes I think to me like um, like having a library of possibilities so I can go into the landscape and find painting possibilities out there in the landscape. And is this the area that you grew up in as well have you always been in this landscape? Yeah it is, it is. <laughs> I haven't ventured very far I don't think our family do tend to venture very far. Uh, <laughs> my father's family uh, farm um, it, near Little Clacton, which is only about six or seven miles away. And I grew up in a house which is probably about 400 yards, 500 yards from where I'm sitting right at the moment. And this is only where, where we live now is only the second house I've ever lived in. So I feel very rooted in the landscape. And this is a landscape I've known since I was little. Mm. And what is it that um, gives you inspiration to keep going back and keep being inspired but by that the kind of I guess it's the same content really. Yes I, I think the um, I suppose it's because it's it's a given it's it's where I grew up and I've got a long association with it um, that it becomes has kind of a depth and a resonance to it for myself and I think then you slowly unpack it and find how it can be used and what I want to use it for. I mean I, I like being outdoors I like um, I've always um, I've been a, like a lifelong bird watcher and I, I just like being outdoors but then you begin to realize that you can actually use the landscape that you inhabit so and I, I think this um, coastal tidal landscape in a sense is very close to the state of painting because it's being constantly painted over and revealed and painted over and revealed so there's a there's a very painterly and it, and it is a flat plain there's not it's not interrupted by lots of things as you can see from this photograph um, there's there's not a lot of things in the landscape so it is a kind of a painterly state that the landscape is in already I think it's really interesting and I guess yeah the, the like you say it, it changes and it's painted over so I guess the light changes constantly doesn't it yes I think because you go back to the same place over and over and over again, you you notice those subtleties. Um, it's not a land like in in the autumn. Everybody talks about the colours of the leaves on the trees and things. I mean, as you can see from this photograph, and and I think in the next one as well, there's 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 not many leaves on the trees because there's not many trees. Um, so, but there's there is a, a seasonal subtlety to the landscape. It does shift through the year, um, but and you learn to because you're observing it every week you learn sort of you learn these kind of subtleties that are in the landscape I guess. Yeah and I, I read on your blog and you uh, kind of mentioned perhaps a difference between a, a view and a moment which I found quite interesting. Oh yes now what did I say? <laughs> I'm intrigued now what did, what did I say? If you, if you, I think one of the things I try and avoid in painting is painting the view mm. so it's um, I always think they are when I go into the landscape, for this image, for instance, is um, I've been working on this, I think towards the end of the slides, there's, there's some paintings of this um, image. And I like this because it's a little box. It's a little sort of square shape that you have to walk around. There's a seawall that comes in from the right of the photograph and you walk around to where I'm standing and then continue off and walk along the left hand side. So there's this little box of water which fills and fills up and empties each of the tides. And so it's like, Rather than it being a view, it's an idea. It's a painting idea which develops from the landscape. But I'm not sure that's exactly what I blogged about. Oh, <laughs> I can't yeah, no, it's fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, Joe, can we move to the next slide, please? So, um, 
This is uh, an image of your garden, and this came up uh, because of an earlier conversation we had. And um, your garden does feed into your work. Uh, and I think you had a friend who you were speaking to um, who said that they like the idea that your work informs your gardening as well. Yes, it looks, looks very sort of bucolic in there, doesn't it? But um, I think that was about May this year. Um, I think it does. I mean, we, we talked about this a, a week or two ago and it's kind of gardening is there in the background of a lot of the things I do. I've, I've got two allotments, which are very near my studio and then a reasonably big garden. Um, and it's always been something I've done. And I think, I think I've never really, I haven't thought about it that much until we talked a few weeks ago, but I think I garden in kind of a painterly way. So it's, um, the things I like in gardening are also the things I like in painting. That's kind of a, a wildness and a naturalness, but it's engineered. It's not, it's, um, it's not wild and natural. It's, it's a depiction of that. But I like that kind of slightly disheveled, abundant, kind of overgrown kind of look to things. The building in there is, um, and it's in the background of that one as well, is, the, um, is my old studio. My dad and I built that um, 30 years ago, but I've, I've got a bigger studio now, sort of away, um, away from home. But you can see from the, I think the texture and the feel of mm. the garden, that overwhelming kind of feel is what I kind of want in painting, I think. Yeah, you can see there's a real appearance of kind of yet the layers of different textures and almost brush strokes really in yes in there. <laughs> I think it's yes the, in this image right in the center of the image there's a there's a sort of a slightly deeper mauve I can't remember what it was now but um this is from a few weeks ago and there's these that those subtle changes which I enjoy in paint as well that you know that a shift from this lilac color through to a slightly mauve color and then it goes out to a sort of a yellowy green a little bit further along so I'm constantly observing this it's different because it's really has got a life of its own um, I'd like to think the painting's got a life of its own, but in a sense, everything that goes on the canvas is there because I put it there. A lot of what happens in the garden is sort of just serendipity, I think, and yeah. then you sort of you decide to go with it or not. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joe. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. So, um, yeah, I think we'll go back and talk about your early influences, uh, really. Um, yeah, um, yes, I think when... Um, I mean, growing up in East Anglia, and I'm only 20 minutes probably away, 25 minutes away from the Dead and Vale, um, um, you, you inevitably, Constable is kind of there in the landscape. And I think, um, I, I remember going to college, uh, to art school in the early 80s and being slightly embarrassed that I liked Constable because no one seemed to be interested in what Constable was doing. It wasn't until sort of Lucien Freud put on that exhibition at the Grand Palais that um, Constable was kind of reassessed as, an, as a painterly painter, I think. But uh, Constable has always been there. And the other, the other artist that early on that I really um, spent a lot of time looking at was uh, Van Gogh. Mm. And I guess, looking back at them, they're both quite accessible, but they both have got a very visible surface to the paintings. You can see what's been done to the surface. And I think those two things probably still creep into my painting, that desire to have something that's got some degree of accessibility, but also it's very obvious and visible what's been done to the painting, to the surface of the painting. Yeah. Did you look a lot at, lot at uh, Van Gogh's drawings as well? I did, yes. There's the, I mean, um, it's slightly depressing because they're so good, but um, I spent a lot of time, I read, read all the letters as well, which um, are just extraordinary. Um, but I, so, I, so drawing has always been a big part of what I've done and um, like looking at his drawings and some of those ink drawings of constables as well, uh, which are sort of slightly less well known, um, they became sort of markers of what was possible, I think, when, when drawing the landscape. This, this image is from, I think this and the next one or two images, are just little pencil drawings, which I tend to make if, I'm, if I go to a museum and, um, and go and see things. So this was the Salisbury Cathedral painting which was at Christchurch Mansion for almost a year, I think it was, a couple, a few years ago. You can just see recognisable bits. There's Salisbury Cathedral in the middle, and there's a little curve, which is the wheel of the car on the on the sort of lower lower left. Yeah, yeah, I can see there. And um, you was Turner ever an interest to you? Or? Oh yeah, well, 
I think I really sort of got Turner quite recently when uh, Turner Contemporary opened down in Margate and I've seen two or three of their displays of Turner's, Turner's work. I've always, um, I was going to say off the record, this is not off the record, is it? But I've always found him slightly big-headed, actually. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think the, um, there's the two sort of poles of 19th century British painting. You've got Constable and Turner. And Turner was like a prodigy. He was an academician by the time he was some ridiculously early age. And he'd go off all over Europe and all across Britain, drawing and painting. Whereas Constable basically stayed at home, either in Dedham Vale or in London, and wasn't an academician until he, he was in well into his 50s. And I think he felt slightly hard done by. But I like the persistence in Constable, that he just, he was focused and persistent. He said it was like, he, I can't remember the exact quote, he was, he'd driven a nail and he intended to sort of drive it completely or something like that. Whereas... Um, Turner was the sort of kind of boy wonder. And I think um, I would definitely side with Constable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, Turner is, I mean, he's a genius, isn't he? But he kind of knew it as well. Yeah, thank you. Can we move to the next one? Can you tell us about this drawing? Oh, yeah, this was from, this is my favourite painting in the uh, National Gallery. It's by Jacob Van Roysdale. Um, there, there was, um, there's a big version which they own and they had on loan a slightly smaller version for a while. And I'm, pretty sure this is from the slightly smaller version but it's just a marvelous sort of marvelously constructed painting but it is also very east anglian even though it's sort of a dutch painting which just makes you realize that the um the the coast the north sea coast um there's a, there's a kind of um there's a north sea rim kind of look which it takes in northern france and belgium and holland maybe even uh, Denmark and then um, sort of North Germany and then East Anglia. So there's this, there's a family kind of resemblance between a lot of the, the art there. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll move to the, the and again, that's, um, that's from the Roysdale painting. Um, the, this is, the, the, the little pencil drawings are done um, in, the, in the studio, uh, in the, in sort of from, from the paintings. This was done in the studio. So this is just charcoal and watercolour, just probably from one of those little um, pencil drawings. I love the charcoal. I'm a massive fan of charcoal. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds so good, doesn't it, as well? Yeah. It's, it's just yeah. a great sound to it. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. And so we'll move on. Uh, there was uh, an exhibition um, that, kind of, that you saw at a certain point in your career. Can you yes. tell us about this? <laughs> yes, this was... Um, I went to, I was at art school between 1980, well, in London, I was there between 81 and 84. And in 1981, there was the, at the Royal Academy, there was the New Spirit in Painting exhibition, which turned out to be quite seminal. I don't think we knew it at the time, um, but we went to, we, my, my fellow students and I, we went to see it. And um, I'm not sure I even liked a lot of it at the time, but I think now, looking back on it, I realised that it was actually quite an important exhibition to have seen and quite influential in my sort of thinking and my own work. And this is, this is an Anselm Kiefer um, painting, and I can't remember what it's called, but um, I, I remember, I distinctly remember seeing this and sort of standing right up close to it and being amazed by this um, clotted sort of burnt looking surface and right along the horizon, there's, there's, um, there's a rhyme written along the horizon, which is a um, German marching rhyme or something. I can't even remember what it is. But it's got, it was like presenting landscape, but also it was layered with history as well. So it wasn't just, it wasn't a view. It, was, it got this other deeper yep. resonance. Yeah. It gives a, an amazing sense of space as well, doesn't it? I think. It does. It does. And I think um, that was one of the things. It's, it's just a flat plane. There's the, I mean, there's a little few little things happening out on the horizon, but it is just one flat plane. So it's, it's the way that landscape equates to the painted surface. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I, I liked in that at the time. And it, it was, it's, um, for Kiefer, it's quite a modest scale. It's sort of, you know, the size of a tabletop rather than the size of a barn. Yeah. Um, I do. Um, um, I prefer a little bit of modesty in painting. I think. Yeah, the next one um, is um, this is George Bazalitz, um, and I know I know he's said lots of odd things and that, but he's he was the it was the color that he was using, which was this high key color, 
but it was very odd kind of northern European colour as well. Mm. And this very um, aggressive kind of uh, um, expressionist kind of drawing in it that was almost like not drawing at all. I'm, I'm never quite sure whether this painting was actually in the show or not. I, I, I thought, think I remember seeing it, but I mean, you think you remember all sorts of things from the past. But he was um, he was one of the painters that kind of, not that I liked, but that kind of shoved me along and sort of in, in my thinking. This 1980, the early 80s was when Nicholas Sorota was at the Whitechapel and uh, the Whitechapel was just down the road from, from the college I was at. So it was our local gallery. So he was showing all of these um, sort of new painting painters at the Whitechapel. So we saw a lot of like Baslitz Kiefer and the, and the sort of the Italian guys and, you know, all, all, all of those. Brilliant. And is, he also does a lot of layering of, of colour as well. Yeah. Is that is that part of what you liked about that? Kind I, of I think I just like the way he sort of like put the paint on um, mm. with in a slightly sort of um, offhand kind of way, very sort of unsophisticated way in a sense. But it added up to something that was that was grand and powerful. It, it wasn't sort of... Um, there was no technique that you had to kind of figure out. You could see everything that he'd done to it, yeah. but there was a, like an emotional intensity um, that came through that. Yeah. Going back to the Whitechapel, was the Whitechapel open uh, on, on at that time? Was it? Um, I don't, I'm not sure, actually. It probably was. I, I don't know. <laughs> it probably was. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next. So um, drawing plays quite a major role in, in your process. And I was wondering if you could um, tell us how drawing plays its part really in creating your paintings. Yes, I think drawing is probably, um, it, it's definitely the starting point for everything I do, but I think it probably is much more than that in the, the way I paint, I think has got quite a lot to do with how you draw or how I draw. So the drawing is like embedded in the whole process of um how I how I think about painting and how I go about painting. So I all of the paintings start with um, from walks I take in the landscape. So I've got certain routes that I go through the landscape at various times, um, and I take um, is all very basic material. So I take a block of A4 paper and a few crayons, graphite sticks, sort of very basic things because I don't want to be loaded down with things. And these, these are the kind of drawings um, that I'll be making. And you can see from the little dates scribbled in the corner, these were all done on the same day. So I'll probably in any one day, in any one walk, maybe make, I don't know, 10 or a dozen drawings, but very often of exactly the same thing. So the two on the, the, the top left and bottom left are both of exactly the same thing, maybe just moved one step uh, to the left. And the... Um, and I mean, the, the, the drawing at the top right is a, a sea wall, which has sort of got washed out and all the slabs are laying on the beach. And I've made drawings of that over and over again. So I'm going back to make, I go, go out and take the same routes, draw the same things and bring them back. But it doesn't, um, you find new things. Every time you look at something, something else is there. You can't ever sort of draw up draw out everything from any any one subject and you get to a certain point and you think all right well I've, I've done that I know everything there is to know and you wait a few months and go to get walk again and it's and it's it's like it's like you've never seen it before it's sort of a whole new thing so it's drawing is how I kind of see what I'm what's before me but it also is how it's brought back into the uh into the studio it's a collection process then. Kind yes, I, th I, I, I always say it's, it's like um, I'm painting the landscape, but mediated through drawing. So in a sense, I'm not painting the landscape. I'm actually painting the drawings. I think that's what I'm doing. I was going to say as well, what, what do, you, do you think there's a difference between painting and drawing and where does that lie? Or do they, is, is there a line? Yeah, that's because um, some, some of the paintings I make are just monochrome with sort of, you know, they're made with drawn lines but drawn with a paintbrush so I tend to think that boundary is very blurred mm -hmm. um, but the one one of the differences for me is that the drawings are the, these kind of drawings are done outside and the painting 
is done in the studio. I always think painting is a studio-based activity. I don't like painting outside. No. <laughs> um, I, it, it's partly because of all the stuff that you have to carry. But it's you've got to make all of the decisions before the canvas under unnecessary pressure, I think. It's, it's a much longer process painting for me, and I need to do it in the studio. Yeah. And do you, do you go ever go out with uh, kind of watercolours or inks or anything like that? I used to I used to paint quite a lot of watercolours outdoors, but mm -hmm. even that, although that is quite light and kind of you can respond quite quickly to what you're seeing, even that I find I found after a while it was sort of um, not helping me see. It was getting in the way of me seeing. Whereas now I think carrying carrying an A4 pad with you, you you can just you can just stop wherever mm. and draw, and you can you can just experiment with things or how things are put down um how things you think they might look you can you can really push the boundaries with a drawing and you're not committing a great deal mm. um, you know of time or anything to, to it yeah. which is, i quite like because it gets you out of your own head when you're working you can be quite direct with it i guess yeah very yeah that's what i try and be i try and be very direct so these um the next uh, drawing and, and the one we'll see in a minute after this these are done from the drawings that i make outside so this one is similar to the one that was on the top right of the little grid of four. Um, it's these big slabs that are laid out on the beach, sort of had the, all the interior of the seawall has been washed out. And um, I suppose what then happens in the studio, through a process of just starting painting and through a process of making more drawings, you're trying to figure out what it is you've got, what information you've got, how it can be constructed and how it can go towards making a painting. A painting has got to be you know, I've got to consider it side to side, top to bottom. It's got to fit into this shape and it's got to sort of work and balance and I don't know, all, all the work that any painting does. But it's trying to use this, use this information as a point that the painting is constructed around, I think. Mm. And do, are you working towards a certain size in your painting or certain format or does that vary depending on the idea that you've got? I, th I think the, the exact kind of size varies a bit, but I tend to think of them either as big paintings, which are anything over about, I don't know, a metre 20, a metre 50, um, and smaller paintings, which are usually about 60 or 70 centimetres, one, one dimension, one, you know, one, one um, measurement. Mm -hmm. And then I make some very small paintings, which are the size of a big postcard, which are sort of that size, but they're on little scraps of card and things like that. So they're either small, medium or large. <laughs> But um, they tend to sort of suggest what they ought to be when, once I've got an idea for the painting. Yeah, thank you. We move to the next slide. This is another um, drawing. The, this is again from the seawall. They've shored up the seawall with these gabions, these steel mesh gabions, which are filled up with rocks. But the sea has sort of unpicked the gabions and the rocks are gradually sort of coming out from them. And then the gabions are then compressed into really fantastic shapes. Um, so this is sort of like some slabs and gabions and things like that, um, sort of around the edge. So the slabs are around the edge and the gabions are in, in, in the center. And is this deconstructed from the previous drawing or is it a deconstruction of it's, it's, um, it's probably it's from another drawing, but um, of, from another set of drawings. Um, but there's a particular point that these things come together in that way. So I think all of my drawings and all of my paintings, I could take anyone out into the landscape and stand them in a particular point and say, right, this is it. You can see that line is that piece there. This line is this piece. And so it kind of, I don't feel I want to take liberties with how the information that's out in the landscape. I want to find some way of putting that information into a painted mm. form. Mm. Thank you. I really love these drawings, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> and so I think we're going to talk about um, materials and, and the way that you use them. Um, can you tell us about your love for paint? <laughs> yes, I think, I mean, it, it, um, I, know, I know there's one or two artists I've listened to interviews to and they said they don't really like the paint. They don't really like the stuff of paint. And my, I think we'll just, well, don't do it then. No one's asking you to do it. You know, if you don't love paint, I don't see why you would bother to paint. Because I think painting is such a fantastic thing to 
to do the way I mean there's all sorts of things color does the way it layers up the way you can sort of mine other colors out of it and the way that that kind of lovely surface you can get with it it's such a rich thing to be involved in it's such a rich kind of um way of dealing with the world and with the sort of how you see the world that I don't know why you'd do it if you didn't love it so I think um I mean you can see in this one in a sense that there's drawn shapes those white shapes are kind of related to the shapes in the drawings but also th this is quite a recent one so this is there's more um painterliness in this one maybe in slightly more color than I have been using recently um but it's trying to find a way for that information that I had in the drawings to sit together and be a painting and not necessarily be a view or a depiction I think and would these it, it would these would this painting work as two on on it two on its own as well would do you see them as individual pieces that are brought together i think I, I see it as one as a piece of work as one piece of work what one um i mean i've been in quite interested for a, well i've been interested for a long time in sort of multi-panel paintings but it's finding a reason for them to be a multi-panel one of one of the things i like is when you work in a hardback sketchbook and you sort of open up the pages you get that gutter line down the middle so you can work across two pages but right down the middle is this very physical, actual thing, which is to do with the book, is this gutter down the middle. And so a lot of these um, recent paintings are about um, like an open book. So I've got, an, I've got an idea in the back of my mind that, of, um, that they'll be called under a generic title, a sort of field guide or something like that. I love those, um, those bird books and flower books you get with all the, where you just look up what you've seen and that. I love that because it's all, the way it's all categorized and everything i really like that and um so it's something to do with that it feels like a ledger that's been opened and the size of them this, this one is um 75 centimeters tall and a meter across so each canvas is 75 by 50. so it's a, it's like the size of a large tome um the, like um like audubon's um book of american birds it's that kind of size um and um, I think that so so having it having that line down the middle is integral to it to what it is. Yeah, lovely. And I think on your back to your blog again, um, you mentioned something about peripheral vision and um, trying yeah. to uh, address that in your painting somehow. Yeah, I, th I think when you're, um, um, I, I mean, I sometimes take uh, photographs with my um, phone when I'm out to put on Instagram and things like that. But you realize when you take the photo that actually you can't get in in the same, in everything in, in the same way that you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Because I've been drawing and I've drawn like the seawall disappearing off to my right. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a little bit of, I don't know, a creek or something heading off to the left. And you try and photograph and actually what you see in a photograph is a, is a sort of isolated chunk that's straight out in front of you. So I do like that, um, the way being out in the landscape and you just move your head a little bit that you can sort of take in a much wider angle but also those things that happen without you you know out of the corner of your eyes so as you're walking you see things out of out of clear vision really but they just happen at the edge and i think say that um, turquoisey blue in the bottom right hand corner that's got that feeling of something that's just flashed into peripheral vision mm -hmm. and it probably wasn't that blue but um, but kind of it's because it's, it wasn't that blue because we kind of filter out all those really weird and unusual things that we see because you yeah. do see colours like that. It's, it's like when you're, if you're down on the beach um, and you f uh, the sun's out at sea, if you move your eyelashes a little bit, you can see little rainbows on your eyelashes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who, who looks at those? So I think, um, you know, it's, it's noticing all those little things. And um, I get um, I get little lights at the corner of my eyes, and I think it's probably to do with my eyes degenerating. But that's quite interesting as well, especially yeah. in the dark. I get little lights down the edge of my eyes. If if there's an optician listening, I've probably got something wrong with me. <laughs> yeah. Do you have you found? Obviously, you've been looking at color for forever. But um, do you still like? Did you find and do you still find that your observations um, are are changing? observations of color changing or, or yeah i think or um, as you observe it yeah that's um 
because in a sense every it's it's always you know a certain color like the marshes i mean the, the light changes so at certain times you get you know different colors and things but there's is a certain range of colors but i think what you're what i'm looking for in the studio is certain mixes of color which can express that so i i'd at some point maybe think i'll, I'll paint all the marshes a deep red and then i want to make that feel as natural and as true as possible so mm. I think there's a gap between the colour that happens in the landscape and you observe and the colour that happens in the studio and you create. Mm. But the colour that's in the studio, I try and make it as honest and natural and feeling that it, it was that colour. Because sometimes people say, well, all your drawings are in black and white. So where does the colour come from? How, how do you remember all this colour? Well, I don't remember it. I make it in the studio. And it's through a process of making and layering and... Um, so sort of just trying things out. At some points, it just looks artificial and faked, and other and then you hopefully to work in towards something that, that feels true to your experience of, of the landscape. Mm -hmm. I think the next um, the next image is is a close up of the, the left panel of this, but you can see this the layers in there are. Um, I mean, that red colour, I think, was a whole painted layer underneath it at one point. And as I've just scraped that bit of green, it's picked out a bit of red, wet red from underneath. And so, I mean, I like, I don't usually take close-ups, actually, of the, the paintings, but I like the whole way that a painted surface can become energised and mobile. And um, it, in a sense, it is it becomes the landscape. It is the landscape. And it stands in a metaphoric relationship to the observed landscape. Yeah, yeah. Do you just use brushes to apply your paint, or do you do you use other tools as well? The uh, I usually just use a very limited range of brushes, um, but more recently, especially with these paintings, I've been once once the surface is up and sort of mobile, I then tend to push it around a bit. So I think these green marks at the bottom would have been sort of just pushed around with a palette knife um yeah i think quite a lot of that has actually because and, and the um the very sort of obvious brush mark ones are done with um house painting brushes that have nearly worn out so you get these very obvious sort of streaking in the paint so mm -hmm. it, I, especially in these paintings i've tried to expand a little bit the um repertoire of kind of marks that i'm using thank you <laughs> looks like lots of fun seeing that those yeah. texts are so close. <laughs> I, I, what I like is when you get, go in the studio in the morning, you put a fur, you put some paint on, and you and you think, well, this is this is never going to be a painting, and you just try things out, and it, it, there's a, there's this level of frustration in painting, which is a positive thing, I think, but you because it makes you push further and further. So, uh, you know, but by say you start at eight in the morning, by about half past twelve, you've painted everything orange because you can't think of what else to do, and then you sort of scrape that back and maybe you paint it white by about two o'clock. And so you're going through these drastic things that you're doing to it in the hope that somewhere along the line, it turns into something, it becomes something other than just paint. And it, it kind of, it kind of does that. And I don't know, I don't know what it is that it does, but there's something that happens and you begin to recognize mm. you, there's a recognition in it. Mm. And after that point, is there, um, is there a, then another process that starts to take place or is that a finishing place for yeah you? i think there's i think you arrive at certain points in the painting when it starts to be something and it's it starts to be something more than what you'd maybe intended for it but um it's quite often you have to arrive at that point quite a few times before it really sort of becomes a painting because i think there's there's um you can do very mad things to the painting you can sort of tip paint on them push it around and everything and it looks quite exciting but it doesn't really add up to a considered painting so I think there's a half part of it is keeping that openness mm. in the paint and part of it is sitting back and considering what it is you've done and it's, it's got to be a thought through process I think it's, yeah. it's not I, I think it's wrong to think of painting as like expression just, yeah. just sort of outpouring of whatever is in the in the painter's kind of soul or whatever it's 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 a bit of that but it's a lot of consideration it's a cultured mm. thought through activity a balance perhaps yeah definitely definitely yeah we've talked a bit a bit about color um 
and and the way you use it. Is there yeah? Is there a particular way that you would say that you would use color? We've kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, I think with um, I do I do like all over kind of things. So quite I I do quite enjoy sort of painting everything one color and things like that. But but it's it's part of a very long process. So so I guess this image I mean it's really painted this old gold kind of color which is a bit of a discovery for me. It's, it's burnt umber mixed with cadmium yellow, which goes to this slightly odd greeny kind of, depending on the proportions, it goes to sort of this odd greeny kind of colour. And I have used it a lot over the last three or four years, so I'm consciously trying not to use it at the moment. Um, but even though it is almost all that mix, there's little bits which I've tried out and sort of then edited out. So there's a dark green like in the middle and up the top left. There's a there's a sort of like a gingery brown at the top. Um, so there's, I like the way things get left over in a painting. So, you know, you might have tried a bit of turquoise and there might be a little sliver of turquoise down the one edge or things like that. And, I, and I'm constantly in, I'm constantly thinking that I want to try to push it to be more coloured mm. and then sort of then hold it, then reining it back so it also feels true. Mm. Thank you. Because I think the next image is actually um, a more recent, the same view, the same kind of, um, there's, there's an island, the, the, that shape across the top yeah. is an island out on the marshes and there's, um, there's a bunkhouse, which is that odd shape on the right-hand side. Um, there's a bunkhouse out there and there's a guy who used to live there until not many years ago and it's completely isolated. You can only get to it by, by a boat. And so I like that shape because it seals off the top of the painting and then in the marshes, you've got this channel which comes down the right-hand side, across the bottom, and then up the left-hand side. So it kind of, it does everything a painting should do. It holds in left and right, it holds in the bottom, and it's got something to seal off the top. And it's such a great kind of, I think I could probably paint it for years, but I've tried not to just repeat myself. <laughs> um, but this, this colour has come up. So there's that old gold kind of colour in there underneath, yeah. and the dark green. And yeah. then I've... Um, in, in in the marsh there's this um un, there's a there's an undertone to a lot of the time which is a warm kind of brown or red or orange which is like an undertone to all of this going on but so i've i've pulled that out as from an undertone and actually it just floated these shapes on the top just to see what would happen and it, i hadn't intended to leave it but um it kind of worked and so i just left it I At like certain that. points, you have to recognise that the painting has sorted itself out and it's not entirely, it's like gardening, it's not entirely my, my <laughs> doing. I like the, the space again, and I think with all the different colours um, and the island at the top, there's a, a wonderful journey that you go on to get to the island. Yeah, and I think it's not, it, it's not like I've planned it out, exactly how all these colours would work together, but you... you in the process of painting, you have to stop every now and then and think, okay, what's what's working, what's not working? Because at the top, um, just just the right of centre, there's some little drips on um, above one of those pink bands. There's some little drips on that old gold colour, and it just fits in mm. exactly with that progression out to the island. But it wasn't. I mean, you know, that just happened, and you just have to recognise that it's just happened. Yeah, and have to have that quite dramatic. Um pink and, and red in the middle, but that not being the focus is always quite clever. <laughs> I think, I think <laughs> just keeping that up on the surface. I, I, I quite like the idea of, um, it's one of the things I'm exploring a little bit, is these shapes, these sort of graphic shapes of the creeks mm. make a patterning on the surface. And then maybe I could float colours on the top of that. So rather than the colour attaching to an area of the marsh, mm -hmm. you sort of separate that out. So you've got the drawing, the graphic kind of side of it, and then you, the colours just sit on the top of that. So um, it's one of the things I've been thinking about for or working with for a couple of years. So um, this one was quite, I, well, I think it's quite successful. I think it's worked quite nicely, that one. Do you think uh, the, 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 the Suffolk coastline has a, a particular colour, the light is coloured in a particular way. Yeah. Does it have a colour? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think I <laughs> see I think it um sometimes if, if you live somewhere a long time, it's difficult to see it dispassionately, ob objectively. But I think one of the when when I went out to uh 
I, my younger brother lives in California and the first time we went out to visit him in California we came out of the airport in Los Angeles and the light was exactly the light that Richard Diedenkorn has in those Ocean Park paintings and all of a sudden you step out on the pavement and you think oh this, this is you know we're like it's being like in an Ocean Park painting you could see exactly how he painted it and I think having had that experience then you come back and you think yeah the, the light here has got um I always think it's like the inside of those oyster shells that pearlescent kind of mm. feel to it and so there's there's all of the colors are in there but they're all on top of each other so you never quite see one color at any one time it's it, but it's just sort of not you know it's not quite layered on top of each other so you're just picking up little bits of pinks and greens and blues and things like that it's interesting my parents are in portland and i went to visit them in the summer and it's so bright down there and the light felt very cold very ice white yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like these um, the days like we've had today when it hardly gets light all day. That's a very um, East Coast um, British kind of thing, I think. And it's sort of you need your lights, the lights in the studio on practically all day to actually see. But I, did, I like that. Yeah. Thank you. We'll move on to the next. you're going to trip me up with this question because what, what we discussed about what makes an honest painting. <laughs> yeah, so what makes an honest painting? What makes an honest painting? I don't know. I think, um, I think that is what I'm heading towards. Um, again, this, this is the same, um, this is the same island across the top there. This is, I mean, it's moved along about 100 yards to the right along the seawall. Um, and, and what do we mean when we say a painting is honest? What, what I think it is about is making it feel as if this is what the landscape was like. So it may, it's a, like a true metaphor for the condition that the landscape was. Because it wasn't um, like there's an area of like baby pink there on the right hand side near the top and this bright yellow at the bottom, which sort of balances it out. And there's an area of sort of uh, vermilion on the left hand side. And I guess those colours weren't actually there but it's like in the painting process, the painting kind of demands certain things and you try certain things out and certain things you do feel true. So I guess that's being honest because I'm not, I don't, I'm not imposing on it a, like a former, like a way of thinking about something. I don't want, want to impose it on, I want to find it from the landscape. So I want the landscape to give that to me, but also you know that it what is is I think Matisse said this. He said, "When you're painting, you've got to believe you're telling the truth, and when you step back, you've got to know that you you aren't." There's something like that. He probably said it more articulately and in French, but um, but it's that kind of dual thing. So you've got to try and tell the truth, but also realize that you're not telling the truth. Yeah, I'm not sure that answers the question <laughs> yes. though. <laughs> I guess you would want the, the landscape, yeah, to do just to uh, for the for the landscape to agree with your choices. Yes, yes. And I think it, tra but it transcends the landscape as well. So because um, I had a conversation with someone just in the, in the street this week, and they were saying, well, maybe people need to understand the landscape to be able to understand your paintings. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I've thought about that. And I think, no, that's not right. It's the other way around. I think um, that the paintings you'd hope would transcend the landscape and be something more resonant that people could pick up on. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think you need to come to the land to the paintings through the landscape. I mm. think you come to the the other way round, whatever I said, but yes. the opposite way round. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Can we move to the next mm. slide, please, Joe? Um, so, as well as a, a painter, you're also a curator, um, and you've also set up um, many successful groups. Can you tell us about about yeah. this? This is all accidental. It's not what I thought I'd be doing, <laughs> or it was all accidental. Um, the, um, yes, um, contemporary British painting is like a collective, um, a collective of artist collective. There's about 70 members now. It came about from an idea of um, Robert Priseman, who's an artist and curator who lives in Wivenhoe, which is not that far from here. And he just, he said, I know it'd be a good idea. And then, um, and then he said, we could set up a group of, rather than waiting for people to give us chances to show in that, we make our own chances. And so we found around, we, we made, each made a list of artists we were interested in, artists of our generation um, that we were interested in. And um, we started and phoned and um, phoned them up, emailed them. 
And we soon got about 20, 25 together. And then it grew from there. This was in um, Ipswich Art Gallery, the old art school um, in Ipswich. And this was back in 2013, I think. And this was kind of one of the first exhibitions we did of um, contemporary British painting. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's grown from there because the next um, the next slide is um, from this year's Contemporary British Painting Prize, which is a Huddersfield Art Gallery, it opened two weeks ago. And so the group now run a national painting prize amongst other things. And also we've worked with um, sort of various museum collections, um, sort of donating micro collections of, work, of contemporary British painting to various museums so that was one of the things I, i'm not um I, I was on the committee and that i'm not i've sort of stepped down from that now and it's it runs itself perfectly well Thanks. probably better without me um and then one of the other things that i'm involved with if we go to the next slide is um colchester art society um which has been a great adventure um the Culture Art Society came to me actually about six or seven years ago to see whether I'd stand as um, as their president, which is I mean it was a great honour because that was only the sixth president since their inception in 1946, and the first two were John Nash and Cedric Morris, and the next one was Roderick Barrett. So there's, there was kind of a lot of East Anglian history wrapped up in Culture Art Society, and I had been a member on and off over the years, but. Um, so over what we've, we've um, how can I put this? We've tried to sort of, con I've tried to connect it back up to the other arts infrastructure in Colchester. So it grew out of the art school in Colchester. Um, so connecting up to that, it's always had a connection with the minories. So connecting it back to that. This was in first sight. And the reason all the writing is backwards, as you can probably see, is because this is from inside and all that writing is on the okay. glass front. <laughs> so so the, the, the giant tree and eye is the Art Society's logo. And this was for the 70th anniversary in 2016, I think it was. And we did a small show at um, first sight, looking at the history of the Art Society. And I'm currently um, co-curating um, an exhibition about Benton End and Cedric Morris and Let Haynes with First Sight, which opens on the 10th of December. And that's um, Culture Art Society and First Sight collaborating on, on the exhibition. So I, th I think over the last few years, and um, we've grown membership, we've doubled the membership in, in five, year, five or six years. And so we've, we've turned ourselves into something that's got a real kind of outward looking, mm. outward looking perspective and a real voice in Colchester as well. And that's been a real adventure and with a good committee. Yeah. We actually get things done. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Um, I think we'll move on to the next slide. Right. So, this, yeah, this was, um, this was only a few, a um, couple of weeks ago in the studio. Um, these, um, so I'd taken a close up paint, a picture of the painting on the right. And um, someone had just messaged me on Instagram and said, can we have a picture of it on the wall so I can see the scale of it? So I just put my yellow chair in next to it so we could see the scale of it. And um, it got, it, um, yeah, it, it got quite a lot of comment on that on um, Instagram. But um, the, the, the painting on the right, I don't really remember the first images we did. There was one of that box shape on the sea wall. So you sort of yeah. like walk round, right around this inlet. And this is from that. So the sea wall shapes are on the right and left. And then this sort of shoreline at the front. But it's, it's an interesting little space because it looks, well, it is artificial because it's had a sea wall built around it. But it's very geometric. So it mm -hmm. feels very odd that there's this inlet, tidal inlet, which is geometric and i've got some i've just uh, there's more paintings in this as well because um you you perceive it as a as a rectangular shape but obviously if you stood there and actually you know you you drew it on a on a piece of tracing paper it's got that very steep perspective in it and so it's trying to balance out saying no it's just it's, it's a box but also hinting that you know it also recedes into space so i think there's there's more i'm going to do on that yeah. Uh, not that particular one. I think that's finished, but there's more with that subject. And then the one on the left is another one of these um, diptych um, uh, paintings. And you can see the scale of it there. Mm. Um, and it's looking exactly the same subject with that island running across the top. 
Um, but it's I'm not sure whether I think that's probably changed since then. It doesn't it doesn't look complete if it hasn't changed. So I might go back to it. I might check that out in the morning. But they're they're kind of a couple of very current um, pieces. Yeah, and you I think going back to your blog again, you were talking about um, gridding up and transferring information and having that kind of working process visible in your paintings. Is that something that you you've done in in the yeah. one on white? Right? Yeah, I I do like. Um, I, I like I like gridding things up. I like measuring it all out and drawing the lines and things. But um, it's quite useful because sometimes you you push a painting and it, it sort of you know it starts to work and interesting things are happening. But um, and then you get a little bit stuck. So it's, you have these strategies how you can just push it forward again. And one of one of the ones that I use is like finding a drawing that's sort of approximates where you've got to in the painting, or going out and drawing again. And gridding that up and forcing, and then gridding up the painting and forcing change onto the painting. So you realise that a line you thought was like halfway across is actually two thirds of the way across. So you have to change it, and it's a way of, um, yeah, a way of forcing yourself to push further forward. And mm -hmm. so I think with the big canvas there, you can actually see some of the gridding up lines, which I quite like. Um, yeah. The paintings I was doing over the over last winter were actually had very obvious gridding up lines left in them on purpose because I was I got this idea that there's certain things you do in the painting like like gridding up like drawing out rough shapes like putting color in you know all of those kind of things I thought I, you could apply them to the canvas but you don't necessarily have to do it in the right order mm -hmm. you can sort of put things in in the wrong order and um, that's another current kind of thing that I'm thinking about brilliant thank you we move on to the next this is the, the final slide Yes, this is, um, I put this, this is probably the most recent painting that I think is complete. And again, it's one of this set with this, uh, of diptych paintings. And um, I, I was having a look at this one today, actually, because I've got an exhibition coming up just after Christmas. And I think it might be this one that goes in for it. But um, I just like with this one, where you open that, you know, you, you open a book up, and you've got information that reads on both sides, but they might not quite match up graphically. And so I like how the join in this one is an internal edge. So things operate with the left and right and top and bottom edges, but also you've got this internal edge where things transfer from the left side to the right side or vice versa. Mm -hmm. But it's still the whole thing still hangs together as one image. And the scale of the marks in this, I was quite pleased... With, it's not a great photo actually is I think that gray on the bottom right is a bit out of focus isn't it but um the um uh, the scale of the marks just worked on this one sometimes you just do a painting and for some reason you you, you don't understand it just works and I think this is one of them and it worked quite quickly for some reason I don't know why you struggle for three or four paintings after that to get anything near it <laughs> How long on average do you take, or is it just so variable that you? Well, well, the big in the previous slide, that big painting on the right hand side, I've been working on that for probably eighteen months, sort of on and off, sort of repainting it. It's it looks completely different through that time, you know, in various guises. I, I, it's stuck with the su subject matter, mm -hmm. to try and understand and 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 use that subject matter, but that that has been rather a long journey. But this one. I, I I don't know how long. I probably three or four painting sessions over maybe a month. Mm. I like to have them around a little while because sometimes I think you can misunderstand the painting you've made and you think it's better than it was, which sometimes it's like confusing the excitement of making the painting with how good it is as a painting. Yeah. And I, I think you, I like them having hanging around a little while so I can get to know them a little bit, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to open it out now um, to questions. We have a few questions in the chat here. So I will start at the top. So here we go. A question from Jo. Oh, was this, was, this was for a specific slide. It said, did you just, Joe says, did you choose this landscape or did it choose you? 
Are you from the area and therefore have had a lifetime of seeing this landscape? Yeah, I think I think the landscape chose me. I think that's a nice way of putting it, actually. Um, there was um, an essay, Peter Virgo, who's um, he was he taught at Essex University, Professor Peter Virgo. He did an essay on me uh, several years ago and he said he asked that question. And it was the first time I'd really thought about it. And um, so he said, if you'd grown up in Cornwall or Goa or somewhere like that, you'd have painted that. And I think, yeah, that's probably true. I think I just accepted where I was and then found out how to use it. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Ruth. Do you scale up your work? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I think work op operates at certain scales. I, I like the... Um, like with a pencil draw, you know, like a, a graphite stick on an A4 pad of paper, the graphite stick has got a certain scale in relation to the whole paper. So there, there is a degree of scaling up, but it's kind of, it's not direct. And it's, it's kind of, um, it's trying to find the right scale of marks and areas and shapes for whatever surface it is that one's working on. I think the danger with painting things that are very little and these, these postcard paintings are painted sort of that size, like a double size postcard. Um, and that was through this idea that you see people spending a long time in a gallery shop going through the postcards. And I'm not sure they spend that long actually looking at the actual paintings. So um, it's this idea that maybe you could paint things that size that would be that engaging. But the danger is then you just scale down everything and you're painting a miniature. Whereas what I'm trying to do is find the marks that will sit on piece of paper that's only I don't know what 15 by 20 centimeters mm. so its scale is very important but it's not a case of just scaling up and down I don't think yeah that's really interesting thank you um there's a question from Emma I think it was to do with a particular slide it says Emma says there looks like there are, it looks like there are two figures in the right foreground all right okay I don't know which slide that right. was um I think in I mean, I do put occasionally figures in, but I tend to not have figures in the painting because I, I tend to think that it's the observer or that it's either the artist or whoever's observing the painting that is the figure in the landscape. Well, so you relate to it in the same way as maybe you'd relate to a, I don't know, a John Hoyland or a Gillian Ayres painting or something like that. You'd relate to it as a viewer and a surface being viewed. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I tend to think that putting a figures in kind of makes it, a depiction but mm. um i i'm that's not very thought through because i do put figures <laughs> in occasionally i think it was addressing this slide actually i've just seen in the chat so um it was about this this piece in front of us here oh yeah because that gray piece on the right i suppose it yeah. could act in the, in the way a figure acts in the la in the uh landscape i hadn't really thought about that yeah i like the idea that because so, sometimes when, when when i had the studio at home um, or down the end of the garden, I had the wall in, in this room, this wall would be where I'd hang the pieces I was working with. So I'd bring them in, try them out in here. And this is when my boys were little and they'd be forever seeing like a squirrel or a deer or a tractor or something in the painting, which is completely unintended. But I think after a while you realise that the human eye just wants to recognise things. So you start seeing things in shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you just embrace that and accept it. It's it's kind of there. I think if you've in, if I've intended this painting, this slide to be like this, if someone else sees a figure in it, that's maybe it enriches it rather than di diminishes it. Yeah, thank you. And there's one last question from Johan, and that is, uh, where was your favourite studio? All right, I, I really like the one I've got at the moment. I've not had many studios. I mean, you'd be surprised to know. So um, when when I first um, when we first got this house, I've, I've lived here for since 1986. Um, we used the front, I used the front bedroom as a studio. It was very small, it was only about 11 foot square. And then for a very short time, I had a, um, an outbuilding at my mother-in-law's house down in the next village. And then my dad and I built this studio across the end, which I did really enjoy um, having a studio at home in the garden. So it kind of brought everything together. But the studio I've got at the moment, it's, a, it's only a mile away from here. And I've got, it's 20 by 30 feet twice because it's on two floors. So I'm very fortunate to have a very big storage area downstairs, which 
everybody else in the family seems to store stuff in as well, which I've <laughs> got to have words about that. And then I've got a lovely painting space upstairs, which has got a nice bank of windows out to the east. So the light is really good. And it's it's just like, um, it's my second home. I spend a lot of time there and I really do like it, even when it's cold. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it's about two minutes from the sea. So it's, it's in Frinton on Sea. It's about two minutes from the beach. So it's not bad. Lovely. Sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we will end there. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to Simon. Thank you so much. It's been a really wonderful evening. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking with you and learning about your work. It's been brilliant. And um, thank you, thank you Joe, in the background for all the technical assistance as well.